Casey. Um, but these two were the brainchild of, of a lot of it, and I want to uh, take a minute to introduce them. But if you don't yet know about the whole weekend's activities, we have um, a schedule up there, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the talk, um, after you hear, hear a little bit more. Um, but there's, there's a field walk tomorrow that is now full, um, as well as a panel discussion tomorrow night uh, with people who are in the water, like Tristan from Recheck, and can tell you what they're seeing this year uh, and what we're seeing as we move forward in this crisis. So please do come tomorrow, uh, and then there's a workshop on Sunday. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the end. So I want to um, encourage you, if you haven't been able to drop $5 in the bucket, do so, because that's what helps put these things on, and we appreciate that immensely. But even more so, if you want to support the Noyo Center by becoming a member, that would be amazing, because that is what is keeping this kind of major programming going. So if, if you want to know more about that, you can ask me or any of our staff. She okay. There's more seats. Yeah. yeah. And there's, there's some seats, seats over here, too, yeah. so I encourage people to Mark and Merle, you can come in here. <laughs> Mark, he's on my board. Woohoo! Mark, he's on my board. Mark, he's on my board. Okay, um, so let me introduce our speakers. It's a real pleasure to have both of these two here. Larry's here all the time, and you probably see his face. Larry's been, is it 25 years that you've been working with Rising Tides? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so Larry, I first got to know Larry though through the MPA process. So Larry was one of the stakeholders when we designed the network of MPAs off our coast here. So Larry is a key stakeholder in that group and an important part of the process of designing and, and figuring out exactly where we're going to do that. Marine but he protected is area. He's a seed lead yeah. harvester really here and has rising tide sea vegetables. He got to taste some of his product earlier. Um, and he's got a really unique perspective that he has from working on this coast for 25 years and being an avid recreational advisor as well. She so, what's an MPA? I was just going to say, tell us that. Thank you, Erica, for asking me that question. <laughs> You're assuming that everybody knows. <laughs> Marine protected areas. So that's basically the network of protected areas that Fish and Wildlife took the lead on putting together for the entire state of California. So real forward thinking for the world, really, to set up this network of marine protected areas that will preserve habitats um, and, and limit certain activities within those regions. The problem is right now we have urchin barracks within those um, MTAs. And so one of the real problems we have to continue to talk about with the MTAs is what do you need to do when you actually do need to do some manipulation. These are supposed to be the control sites that aren't manipulated. <laughs> so anyway, we have to talk about that um, with our MTA teams. <laughs> 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 yes, we have a sea urchin. Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> talk about that too. <laughs> so I also want to introduce Josie Iceland. She is a uh, author of now seven books. Yeah. Josie? Yeah. Um, this one, if you haven't had a chance to hold it and look at it, is the latest. It's uh, one of the best I've seen, um, both in the visuals that you get about our kelp species on the North Coast, but also in creating a, a narrative that's really understandable to all of us. So. Um, Josie just published this book, so that was one of the impetus for yeah. having this is brand Josie new. here. She's an artist and a writer, so she's also the artist that's done these amazing images and will be leading um, some of our workshops later. So I will let these two take it from there. Thank you both for coming. We're also using you guys as guinea pigs tonight. And some of our bigger audience presentations, we need sound systems. This is our first experiment with these wireless mics. If they cause problems, I'm just going to shut them down. We don't really need them in this room. But we want to learn how to use them. So I'll shut it down if it starts bothering me. <laughs> Ignore the man. <laughs> You're a little hungry. So actually the overview, and I'm going to need help with this, Josie, 
So the overview of this talk is I'm going to be talking about um, rising tide sea vegetables, what we've been doing harvesting seaweed on the coast here, um, a little bit of history about seaweed eating, um, and then I'm going to talk about species that we harvest, um, a little bit about upwelling, downwelling, um, a little bit about Fukushima because a lot of people have questions, um, and then a lot of people have questions about seaweed and like what are we harvesting? There's no seaweed. Um, and then, um, Josie. I, I think you can just, you know, plow right ahead. I would just <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Okay. You're going to get the end. But there will be time for questions at the end. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, just, so once so we're just, done, just then we'll, it. we'll take questions. Um, so let's see. Let's see if this thing actually works. And we've titled this, this talk Our Kelp because you guys are really. You know, this is your community, and, and we're a lot of what I'm going to talk about is the bull kelp, which is right here, and this is your kelp. So when we say our kelp, this is really a term specific for this community. So I just want to start with that. <laughs> so rising tide sea vegetables is a wholesale business, primarily been in existence since 1981. Um, and I came into it in 1995. And we sell about 30 different products. This is me doing a demo at a store, probably a co-op, with one of our products, which actually you see out there. Um, so we sell, um, the heart of our line are the seaweeds that we harvest here on the Mendocino Coast. So we harvest four different species, and then we make various value-added culinary products with them. And we make those products at our commercial kitchen, Chubby's Kitchen, which is um, a bit up by the food bank, actually. Um, and so there's my lovely wife, Erica, and there's our uh, good friend, Rel, and they're making some of this tsunami, actually. So, um, and in this kitchen, there are actually about, at this point, I think right now, there are about five other businesses using the kitchen. And they use it by the hour so that they can produce products in a certified kitchen. So that's another thing that we do. Um, and uh, primarily, we're a wholesale distributor. So we harvest seaweed here on the coast. We import seaweeds from um, Maine. We actually import some uh, sushi nori sheets from China. And yes, we're affected by the trade war, big time. Um, and uh, so that's, that's our wholesale line. That's really most of our business. And about 10% is out of our website, loveseaweed.com. And so retail customers also buy seaweed. Um, from us in that venue. Um, and the reason I wanted to do this, uh, other than the fact that my ex, Kate, started the business and we got into a relationship and I thought, oh, this is, a, this is a great woman and a great business until we worked on it, is that I've been into natural foods since I was a teenager and, and into whole foods and into right livelihood and the idea of right livelihood. So I wanted to do something that would be sustainable and be sustaining people in order to, for me to make a living. Um, it's important. Um, and uh, let's see, where do I think I'll go ahead. So, you know, the history of seaweed eating with the indigenous cultures goes back forever. I mean, the oldest human remains in the Americas um, was somewhere in either Chile or Patagonia was found and it had seaweed in the gut. It was frozen, um, uh, it was frozen. And so seaweed goes way back, and of course the native people here ate a lot of seaweed. And um, you know, and it's especially easy to access here, especially sea palm and nori, and a few of the others. Um, and uh, they actually would eat it whole, and especially nori, they would just dry it. And it's funny, we gave nori to a, a native woman, and she said, where are the goodies? <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? She said, the critters. And so what they would do is, because the critters were so nutritious, they would just dry all the, the invertebrates in there, and they would eat them. And, and actually, I, 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 I eat Isaac Butts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, You're yeah. not eating yourself. What kind of critters would that be? What's that? What would that be? What kind of critter? Uh, it's a little crustacean. looks like a pill bug, but it's about that long. And because we get by a catch, and I like Shrimp, I eat. <laughs> um, so, so seaweed eating goes way back, and then in the U.S., um, when a lot of people were getting into macrobiotics and into whole foods in the 60s and 70s, Michelle Cushy and um, 
Herman Ahara and a few other people came from Japan and spread the macrobiotic movement. And that kind of got itself into the whole foods movement in this country. And so some of the names that we use are actually adapted from some of the Asian names in order to make it recognizable. Um, so like the combo that we harvest is exactly the same species, but it's generally the same uh, as an example. Um, and so now, you know, in contemporary America, it's, it's really uh, become something that people really recognize as a superfood, too. Um, and let's see. I'm trying to see what this thing is. Um, so here, um, we harvest mainly four different species, and it's interesting because right here, I've seen probably ten different species, and three of them we harvest. And so, like, that's me cutting kombu or laminaria up on the top of sea palm with, above my head. And you can see just how rich this is. This is in 2012, I believe. And in a lot of places, the intertidal zone actually looks this good. Um, not everywhere. Um, we're fortunate in that our beds have actually done really well. They're not, as, certain species like sea palm and nori aren't affected at all by urchins. Um, Visagrisia is unaffected in some areas. In other areas where the rocket goes down a little deeper and it's going down, it'll get affected by the urchins. Um, the laminaria that we harvest in Kambu, I haven't seen any effects of the urchins in there at all in our beds, but other people have reported that urchins have, have, have become barren. Um, and, uh, you know, then, of course, in the subtitle zone, as everybody knows, it's not that good. I'm a, I'm a free diver, and um, so I free dive in spearfish, and about, oh, and I have a clear memory of about 2012 being in this wonderful cove in North Casper with lots of uh, understory seaweed called pterogophora that grows to maybe eight feet tall and it can get so thick in places that you just can't really see through it. And there was an opening in this in this pterogophora and there were about 10 fish just kind of cruising around. And I'm like, I got my spear kind of this is cool. And I get up there and I'm maybe eight feet away and those fish just go chum, and they're gone. And I'm like, oh, damn. But I'm also thinking, oh, this is very cool. <laughs> because there is a lot of habitat and there are a lot of fish hiding in here. So, you know, that's just kind of a, uh, an example of, of how profound the changes are in the subtitle zone. Because none of that habitat is there. There's none, there are none of those pterogopher plants there at all um, in that whole And uh, let's see. So, what time of year, Larry, is this? Yeah. That you're, that you're, um... Yeah, so we. Just a second, I'm trying to get. So, when we're harvesting. <coughs> yeah, that's, that's good. When, when we're harvesting, we're harvesting in the summertime. Um, and so, what's happening is. Uh, I actually, I realize I want to back up because one of the things that someone asked me about are the. Department of Fish and Wildlife Regulations. And um, so I want to just touch on that really quickly. One of the things that's unique about our area is that um, about 35 years ago, a couple of people were doing hand harvesting. Like basically in the first couple of years of the hand harvested seaweed industry here, a couple of people got together with some biologists with Fish and Wildlife and um, said, you know, we should really look at how to make this more sustainable. And so there was a very forward-thinking biologist in Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Game at the time, who was able to put through some regulations very quietly because there wasn't any real pressure to basically ban the, the real, um, uh, to basically make the Mendocino Coast, and I believe the Sonoma Coast, a hand harvest only uh, uh, industry. And so there would be no mechanical harvesting and no massive scale be hand, hand harvested edible seaweed would be the only one, only allowed use, only allowed harvesting. And then they also tagged on a no harvest of bull kelp um, by any other industry either, because this person was a very forward thinking biologist and there weren't any, there weren't any good commercial pressures at that point. So it was really a perfect time to get all of that kind of pushed through. So, you know, and at that point, it would have been hard to see what the what the concerns would be because there was just so much kelp out there. 
Um, so anyway, that's that's um, that. So we harvest in the summertime to to answer. We harvest starting in the late spring, say late April, first of May, and we harvest through July because that's when these seaweeds are in their prime. Because as a lot of you know, the seaweed that's we're looking at here is what's there in the summertime. And most seaweeds just die off in the winter. Most seaweeds are annuals and um, they'll just be here blooming in the summertime and then they die off. And of course, one of the reasons that they're so prolific here is because of the upwelling phenomenon. And um, if you aren't familiar with the upwelling phenomenon, I'm not great at explaining it, but the rough draft is that the northwesterly winds that come in here the trade winds in the spring and summer drive this cold water from the cold underwater cold canyons deep in the in the ocean where the nutrients have been dissolving and bring them up to the coast at the same time as we have the sun because we're close to the summer solstice. So that drives the ecosystem um, and that makes allows these these plants or plant-like structures in this case. Um, to get to their macro stage and just put out tons of spores so that they can, can get themselves reproduced by, you know, say late fall. And then in the fall, when the big winter storms start pushing in from the southwest, all this seaweed gets ripped loose. And those seaweeds are affected by the downwelling cycle. So there are really three seasons here. So this is seaweed, this is in May of 2012, and this seaweed has been ripped loose by one, this, so this was probably, this could have even been October 1st, but one of the first fall storms came in, big weather systems with a lot of power and just ripped stuff loose. And this is super important because this stuff is getting ground up on the beach, this is a class beach, um, this is getting ground up on the beach, there are probably 20 different species of seaweed in there. and. A lot of this is going back into the system, into the water, all kinds of critters are eating it. It's the end of the reproductive cycle, so everybody's eating this stuff, all the little fish, the young of the year, all the fryer eating this stuff. And then the kelp flies and all the invertebrates <coughs> that thrive in here just start proliferating and all this stuff. I mean, they literally have their life cycles tied to these kinds of drifts. And I've seen these drifts where um, this is like, I can see about 10 different species here. There's sea palm, there's a little neuroncystis, there's laminaria, there's all kinds of reds. And I've seen, like, in this one photo, there could be like 200 flies. And so what happens is in the fall, when the seabirds are migrating <coughs> south, all these patches are super important for them to stop and feed. Because if they stop and they can't feed, on this um, really rich ecosystem that's really kind of ephemeral, then they literally just die. I mean, they, they run out of energy and they die. So that's so that's the fall cycle. So all of this, all of these nutrients are being being created in this whole cycle. And then in the springtime again, we get the storms moving away. We get more northwesterly flow for the upwelling, and we get more surf like this. It's not really storm surf. It's just weather patterns that are coming in from the northwest and there's a lot of sun generally with that so things can photosynthesize and then everything starts to bloom. All the all the spores that have been water, all the, is it gametes that I'm after? All the gametes that have been waiting to just become uh, a sporophyte phase start blooming and this is what really drives that the ecosystem is that northwest really And so that's when, in the early spring, summer, is when we go out and harvest. So it's either three or four people go out, we harvest about 700 pounds a day. We do about 30 to 35 harvests a year of four different species, sea palm, kombu, or laminaria, alaria, wakame, and nori. Um, so we start doing that, we'll be out at dawn, um, harvest for about five hours, and then um, bring it back to our drying yard and dry it, or say 700 pounds. Once it's dry in the sun in the afternoon, it becomes about 100 pounds. So that's how we do it. And then once that's all done, after three months, then we're, we're actually back just doing all of our processing, managing the business, packaging, and all of that. Um, and this is the one that I love so much. Um, and so you can see how thick it can be. I mean, it's just dense there. Um, 
And then this is actually an example of sea palm harvesting where um, you can see that we're, okay, I know there's a pointer here. So you can see where I'm cutting. The, the, the spores of sea palm, sea palm is a very unique, um, a very, has a very unique reproductive cycle, and it drops its spores directly from those fronds, the, the rib section of the frond, right down onto the rock, and they just kind of attach. And then they come, they start to grow in a few months. And so if we were to cut, like say, that whole head off, and those fronds, that rib section of the frond weren't there, and if we, say, did that on that whole patch, because they dropped directly underneath there, this patch can be completely gone, and it doesn't take long. So they're really um, uh, easy to eliminate. So this is the one species here that's only harvestable by commercial, because the commercial industry is so small, and we harvest year after year, and we've actually helped um, VFW develop the regulations for these so that they allow us to do it because they don't have an educational issue on their hands. There would be no way for them. They haven't come up with a viable way to really educate the public on the reproductive issues with this. And there have been places where this has been eliminated by recreational divers in years past because they didn't realize. Um, so that's one, har one species we harvest. Um, that's us. Loading boats, that's about 600 pounds of seaweed on those three boats, so it's about 200 pounds a boat. And then we'll paddle back with those, that's an offshore rock. Um, you can see that's years ago, and you can see all the bull kelp in the water. That's me harvesting combo or lemon area. When we harvest that one, I'm in the water with the tube, and we're cutting it, and we'll cut about half the plant away and leave about half the fronds there. So it'll come and it'll continue to grow out of that scar. Um, this is one that grows pretty deep, and um, it's, our beds are doing really well, but there are places where those beds are affected by the urchins. Um, this is actually wakame or alaria in elk. Elk has the most amazing bed of alaria probably anywhere in the world. Um, it's acres and acres and acres and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds of it. And um, I've never seen an urchin there, and there are reasons why that is, but I won't get into now. Um, uh, and so um, this is the Alaria. These are the um, sporophytes right here. That's where the spores come out. So we're cutting it like up here somewhere. And then those, those sporophytes are, are intact. And in fact, if we cut it right there this week and we come back next week, it's, it's, the growth is about up there by the next week. Um, And this is, this is, that's Elk Beach. Um, whoops. So that's Elk Beach. We were right there, and it's about 200 vertical feet, so this is a 200-pound wheelbarrow. And we got all the way across the beach there and up, and the truck is up there, and then we'll take it back and dry it in the afternoon. So we were out there at dawn, and this is probably about 10 o'clock. Um, and this is Nori. Um, interestingly, Nori grows high up on the rocks. It's not affected by urchins at all because it just grows in areas where urchins can't even come close. It's out of the water. It's adapted to be out of the water for a lot of hours in its life, in its whole life cycle. And it seems to be one of the winners of climate change. And the reason why is that I'm noticing a lot more rock exposed. And Nori needs these kind of shallow, these high areas with a lot more rock that has a kind of combination of rock and sand. And with, in a lot of these areas where we're seeing nori, say in June, those areas would have been sanded in in previous years because of, um, in the winter time we have big swells, it storms come with a lot of energy, and they just pull the sand away. So that's the yearly cycle. They pull the sand away, it exposes all the rocks. We see all this area, that, all this rocky coast we haven't seen before. And then as those diminish in the late spring and we get more of the northwesterly swell, that sand tends to drift in. And that it's been offshore and then it drifts in. But that isn't happening as much now. Um, and there have been other things, you know, issues I've heard with marine mammals in other places, like on the Farallones, where some beaches don't exist anymore that are, are really important um, marine mammal um, uh, uh, breeding areas. So like this, this spot, has just acres and acres of nori, and really it should have been starting to sand up. Um, but that's just the way it is. It, it seems like it's a winter um, in, the, in the climate. Um, 
And why is it the sand coming back to you? So the sand comes, the, because we have bigger swells, like for instance, this year we had all those big storms in May. And those storms just kept on pulling and pulling and scouring the beaches. And so, you know, this gentle swell letting the sand kind of drift back in wasn't happening. And so that's because we have more extremes in our winds and our, uh, you know, wind equals waves, basically. Um, so this is what happens, though, is it eventually stands in um, in most places. And this is nori drying out in our drying yard. That's some of our drying tables. So we dry, we harvest in the morning and we just spread it out as fast as we can so it'll dry in the sun. Um, and then it'll be pretty much dry by 5.30 in the evening. And then we put in our solar heated drying room, finishing room, and it's completely dry by the morning. Um, uh, How far inland is that? Uh, four miles. And then if we don't have sun, we've actually got the possibility of drying in our drying room. So we can use gas heat if we have to. And so this picture, I wonder who took this picture. <laughs> so past tense. Um, so Ron, right in the front row there, took this picture of me in 2008. And all this bull kelp just blows my mind. Um, I want this bull kelp. <laughs> it's, you know, and also something that's interesting is we don't harvest bull kelp, by the way. Our logo is, is a bull kelp plant, but we've never harvested bull kelp. It's just such an amazing plant. The um, hand harvested industry can harvest 4,000 pounds per license, but I don't know of anybody who's doing that. Um, as far as I know, nobody's taking bull kelp, um, and especially now. I don't think anybody it's, a very, it's about four businesses that do this on the coast. Um, and I don't think anybody's taking bull kelp. Um, why not? Uh, well, for one thing, I mean, the original reason why we didn't is because we couldn't, we didn't have a product that we could market, and we didn't find we could efficiently drive into the fronts. And so both of those were reasons why we didn't do it originally. But you know, now I'm just glad we never developed a product. You know, we we were a thing of doing pickles at one point. Somebody was doing that, but you know that. Because it's too thick, or why couldn't you dry it? Uh, to actually, to the fronds themselves stick together, and they're too thin. We couldn't process them efficiently. You know, um, it's actually a great seaweed to eat, but um, but yeah. So you can see yeah, that so. this is the biomass. You know, I'm kind of making this wild, wild guess in this photo. This is off Van Dam. This is about a mile off Van Dam at the North Cove, right off Ron and Charlene's house, and. Um, I'm going to make a wild guess that there's probably 20,000 pounds of bull kelp that we're seeing here just under the surface because the fronds are hanging down 10, 12 feet. And um, just think of all of that as the nutrients, the carbon that's being sequestered, and the habitat that we just don't have now. And it's really critical that we think really hard about how we can bring this back, and you know, what can we do to this eco for this ecosystem that's compromised and has has had a major sh phase shift? So we have our work to do here. So yeah, thank you. So that's yeah, we'll have questions at the end, but the answer to your question is no. This doesn't exist at all. Like not one piece of that is we probably right. Well, There's a little bit way offshore, yeah. but not close to shore at all. And it's very little. Right. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to tag team here, and there are um, three or four seats here if anybody wants to come um, have a proper seat. So please. Um, yeah. So um, I want to say thank you so much to Larry. Uh, my next slide, I kind of thought, oh, um, I would um, move on from Ron's uh, slide to, um, there's a couple back here as well. Um, and so this was taken in 2017 when I came up and went snorkeling with Larry and it was one of my, it was just such a fantastic weekend and I can't say enough about how much I appreciate Larry having been in the intertidal zone for so many years and having that kind of long-term memory that you guys have here. And I mean, I'm just kind of an interloper, but a very interested one. And um, I think it's really important to, to remember that it's easy to lose that long-term memory and to think like that this would be normal. 
And this does look pretty normal. I mean, it looks like there's some bulk kelp there, but there's actually a ton of space in here compared to that picture we just saw. And this patch actually ends right here. And this was 2017, and I just drove up today and stopped off at Van Dam. And, and to your point, I saw six, six bull kelp heads. There is no bull kelp out there at all, and it is just completely um, shocking. So I think this is a pretty powerful, um, you know, kind of, I took some photos, so in the next, in the next presentation there will be photos of beautiful Van Dam, and that could be seen as normal. It's a beautiful state park, uh, but you and I know, and we have to keep these stories going to make sure that a new normal is not considered uh, normal. Um, so I come at uh, the science of seaweed as an artist, and so we're going to kind of shift gears here, and um, I, I have uh, no training as a scientist, but I am a, I'm an eager learner, uh, and I have been looking very carefully as, as an art maker for a long time, and that has taken me into the science of seaweed. Um, and I originally have, I've been using my scanner as a camera for a long time. And the scanner allows me to make these very straight ahead portraits of the seaweeds that uh, resulted in this book, um, uh, An Ocean Garden, which is kind of a visual primer. It's, it's, it's what I, it's the, it was the beginning of my um, step into the world of seaweed. Uh, and then um, The Curious World of Seaweed uh, is, as, as Linda just said, it's just out. It's really exciting. It's a deep dive into 16 iconic Pacific Coast seaweed. So each chapter is devoted to a particular kelp or seaweed. And I really, I am combining the natural history, what makes that particular seaweed successful in its particular niche of the intertidal. Um, and, I, and I'm very adamant about having these stories be algal-centric. Um, there's a lot out there about how we can use seaweed to, you know, save us from all the ills that we have brought down on the world. But I really want to focus on these organisms for themselves. And then I bring in the history um, of who studied them, the taxonomy, where was the type of specimen found. Um, but it all began with, like I said, these kind of straight ahead portraits, uh, where I'm using my scanner, like you see on these pieces here, to really let the algae speak for themselves. And uh, these are another installation um, that was in New Haven a year or so ago, and it was in conjunction with the Northeast Algal Society's annual convention. And one of the things I have found the most um, um, satisfying for me as an artist is to be accepted into the scientific community uh, and really um, be thought of as an asset to, to the researchers who are so passionate about these seaweeds. And the, the mantra for this particular meeting uh, was broaden your impact. So I uh, designed this whole installation in the gallery at uh, the University of New Haven, where the conference was, and then um, we did a talk in that um, conference. And the seaweed, the seaweed scientists are so welcoming and generous with their time. I couldn't have written this book without all of the papers that were sent to me uh, by the specialists in their particular uh, species. Um, and so it's been a wonderful uh, confluence for me. Um, and I've got to show these in, in all sorts of, so it, it really, having these here in the Neuer Center uh, makes me very, very happy. Um, so this is a piece, so my newer work is where I'm really trying to work in conjunction with the historical imagery that was very much tied to the first naming of the species. And what I found is that taxonomy, the, the, the um, scientists who are actually looking very carefully and describing these species for the first time, usually have some visual component to those descriptions. And um, what we have here is uh, the fantastic, fantastic lithograph of Nereocystis lutkiana, uh, the, um, the, the uh, Latin name for bull kelp, uh, which is named after Lutki was the captain of the Russian uh, exploratory expedition that went to Alaska, and uh, they had a couple of naturalists aboard uh, a fellow named Mertens, who was the real naturalist, and then they had this geologist that they had brought aboard, and his name was Alexander Postels. And Postels turned out to have this fantastic ability to draw, and he was particularly drawn to the marine algae. Um, and so he uh, took all these um, drawings and specimens back to Russia, and he partnered with this uh, fantastic botanist 
in Russia named, um, named Ruprecht, and they made this uh, portfolio called Illustrationis Elgarum, and it was published in 1840. It's these huge lithographs that I had the great opportunity to see in Southern California at USC. So I'm actually starting to work uh, with my contemporary images or scans worked in with the historical imagery. And I've kind of reversed my classic um, kind of iconic bull kelp image to be a little bit ghostly because this is, you know, this is like, where is it going? Um, and one of the things about this working with contemporary and his historical is that I feel like the work creates a vector of sorts between past and present. Uh, and vectors, of course, have, have an arrow at the end of them. So this is about this trajectory beyond now and really raising the question of where are these seaweeds going to be? Um, and that's very much part of the question behind this work. So I thought um, I'm going to have a lot more pretty pictures at the end. If we have time, I'll kind of bomb through them. But I thought I would go through um, our Neriocystis uh, or bull kelp. Uh, and this is an image of a couple of juveniles. Uh, and they're very useful uh, for just <coughs> learning the parts of the seaweed. Um, this is it's a simple architecture. The kelps are the most differentiated of all of the seaweeds. The kelps are a subset of the browns, and they are the ones that have more different parts. Um, so one of the basic necessities of all seaweeds, whether they're kelps or otherwise, is that they have to hold on to the bottom. They can't be swept away uh, to, to last, to succeed. So the bull kelp has, and, that, and that, um, that element holding them to the bottom is called the holdfast. The bull kelp has, relative to its size, rather a small holdfast. Um, now, one of the things about bull kelp, I'll say right here, is that it is an annual. So other kelps are perennials, as, as Larry mentioned. <coughs> but this bull kelp has to do all of its growing and all of its reproducing in a matter of months. Uh, and then the winter storms tear it away. And it's not that hard because the whole fat is just not that big. It has this um, really um, uh, flexible stipe. Uh, so it is very, um, uh, what was the word? Uh, not aerodynamic. Hydrodynamic. Hydrodynamic. <laughs> right. yeah, for some reason, that kept me. Um, it has this very hydrodynamic shape with this very flexible stipe. It has a gas-filled bladder that actually has 5% of carbon monoxide in it. And the service of that bladder is to get this up as close to the surface of the ocean uh, so that all these blades can photosynthesize as efficiently as possible. And you'll notice as you look at most of these seaweeds that the blades um, are flattened out and that is maximizing the surface area to volume, all in the service of efficient photosynthesis. So these kelps and seaweeds, they, they photosynthesize. They also have direct access to all of those nutrients uh, that Larry was talking about. All of the cells can uptake directly the ocean nutrients. Uh, so that's how they can do this remarkable amount of growth uh, in a matter of months and create all that biomass. So here are some images that are in the book. I use historical pressings. Uh, the uh, University of California at Berkeley has an herbarium that has collected all of the pressings, <coughs> collected all up and down the West Coast. Uh, so it's a really fantastic collection. And there are some people that you'll come to know if you read the, through the book that Mrs. J.M. Weeks collected this probably in the 1890s. Um, and uh, she comes up throughout the book. There are lots of little treasures in the book, so if you kind of keep your eyes open, you'll, you'll notice them. So in the, in the, in the um, early spring, late February, early March, uh, the kelp uh, start out as these tiny kelp, all kelp start with just a stipe and a single blade, and then the bladder or nematocyst starts to develop, and the blades start to divide. And uh, this happens uh, throughout the spring uh, with that upwelling and cold ocean. We can't emphasize enough how cold oceans hold more nutrients and are really important for the growth of this kelp in particular, for seaweeds in general over, for our north coast, but for bull kelp, uh, that cold ocean is really important um, because it has to grow from those little um, a couple inch tall um, sporophytes uh, to the um, massive and majestic uh, mature bull kelp uh, by June or July. So that's a matter of four or five months. It's grown up to 60 feet. Um, so that is a tremendous amount of growth of biomass. And it depends on the upwelling on the cold ocean, on being able to hold on to a rocky bottom. 
um, and to be safe from predators, from, from herbivores. Um, so to finish the life cycle, come uh, the middle of the summer, uh, if you see some kelp, some bull kelp on the shore about now, if it's been washed up, if you look at the blades, you'll probably find these patches, and these are the spore patches called sori. And each one of these patches has millions and millions of spores. Uh, and they kind of migrate down the blade uh, as the summer progresses, and then they fall away. And you can see here how it's just fallen right out, making this beautiful hole. One thing I'm able to see on my scanner is the details. I can get way down in there and see that actually, right around the edge of these sori, the cells actually just give away. And that's what lets these patches fall pretty completely down to the base of the parent plant. So the base of the parent plant is probably the odds are good that it's a good <laughs> habitat for the new baby um, babies to, to uh, survive. Um, they don't broadcast like other spores. They kind of fall away in patches. Um, this is an image of those that, that those um, scans. I just I show this because it's um, for me it's about walking this line between fine art and scientific illustration. And this is an image I can show in a gallery. It's got this wonderful abstract quality to it, and yet I know uh, how it came to be. Um, so this is what um, when you're snorkeling. In the late summer, this was when snorkeling with Larry um, a couple of years ago, right in Van Damme, I believe. Um, and the, the blades actually look like cookie dough once you've cut out the cookies. You can see where some of the spore patches are still there, but some have fallen away. And it really is like they've, they've been um, cut out. Um, uh, so interestingly enough, the kelps and seaweeds have a very complex life cycle that involves an alternate generation, a whole other side that whereas these all are producing spores, these big giant bull kelp, they're, they're referred to as sporophytes, those spores actually develop into um, an egg and sperm creating two little separate microscopic organisms. And they hang out down there in the rocks, and it's the winter months, right, because this is this is, is September, uh, late August, September, October. It's dropping its spores. Over the winter, these uh, tiny microscopic um, gametophytes uh, hang out and produce egg and sperm. And at some point, the sperm actually fertilizes the egg. And that fertilized egg is what grows into that little baby kelp that we saw collected by the Mrs. Weeks. Now that alternate generation is not very well understood, and it's one of a couple issues about, about bull kelp that really make it special is one is it, it is an annual, and a lot of the other kelps are perennials like the macrocystis and the ecclesia. They have whole fasts that persist throughout the winter. The other thing about bull kelp is that it is, it's thriving in a very rough territory. It actually likes the rougher waters. Um, uh, Van Dam is pretty protected, but bull kelp typically grows in, in rough waters. It's cold waters. It's northern California up through British Columbia and Alaska. This is not an easy place to go diving and, and study these tiny little organisms that are microscopic and hiding in the rocks. So I really love it when I can, I, Tom Mumford is a bull kelp expert up at Friday Harbor Labs and I can go to or to Tristan and say, you know, what do we know about this alternate generation? We just, there's a lot that we don't know. And I have never heard of it being cultivated in the lab. Um, so I think of the bull kelp as something that is really wild. It is one of these majestic organisms that is so of its place that we don't necessarily understand it completely. And that, to me, is something to be revered and, um, to really, you know, like you all are being concerned about when it when it's kind of um, not doing so well. So here we have um, this nice healthy bull kelp on the left, um, and then uh, when we were out snorkeling uh, that time, I got to see the urchins in action. On the right there is a very nice bull kelp. It's still it's hold fast, is connected to the rocky bottom, but um, the urchins have actually pinned its blade to a vertical rock face. Uh, and are eating uh, the kelp. Uh, and this is what, um, what we've seen to greater and greater degrees. And the urchin population has exploded uh, around here for a number of reasons. And uh, firstly, there were a couple of ocean warming events. Uh, so in 2000, 
uh, 16, I think it was when the warm blob came down. Um, and there was this warm blob that came down from Alaska, it kind of sat off the northern California coast. Uh, and created all this uh, bizarrely warm ocean. And then uh, there were other ocean warming events uh, that coincided um, with um, uh, a, the starfish wasting disease. And starfish wasting disease occurred all up and down the west coast from 2013 to 2016. And one of the primary kelp hunters, the Pycnopodia or big sunflower sea star, kind of succumbed to the starfish wasting disease. It was pretty much killed off. And so what has resulted uh, is this unbelievable blossoming in the uh, urchin populations and this regime shift from healthy kelp forest to urchin barren. And Sheila's been mentioning this sense of uh, this term urchin barren. Um, and it is uh, a regime shift that can actually happen quite quickly. Um, and this is what it looks like where you just have um, acres and acres of the, um, of, of the urchins. So I just wanted to show this diagram here because it, it shows this trophic cascade uh, that I'm kind of referring to pretty clearly uh, where you have, if you have top predators in the system, um, they offer resilience and stability so that when other stressors come in like warming oceans, there's, there's some stability built in and a possibility for resilience against those stressors. Um, so in this case, two of the, the, the um, top predators uh, that would be typically, or that, that, that the bull kelp evolved with on our north coast was uh, the Pycnopodia, or sunflower star, which I show you here, which are these um, very kind of large and efficient urchin eaters. And then, of course, there's the sea otter. And the sea otter has not been uh, here on our northern California coast for about 170 years. But this is their native home. Mm. Sea otter thrived all up and down the California coast through British Columbia, Alaska, um, and through the Aleutians down into the Kamchatka Peninsula and even into northern, um, northern Japan. But often it's forgotten when we talk about the bull kelp here. The, the sea otter's kind of dropped out of the story often. And I just think that it's really important to remember that all of these organisms evolved with this very efficient top predator in the system. So otter have a huge metabolism. They don't have blubber like other marine mammals. So they have to eat about a quarter of their body weight every day. And if urchins are healthy, um, they are voracious urchin eaters. They also eat abalone, they'll eat clams, they'll eat other invertebrates. Um, but they're very, if urchins are healthy, uh, they're very good at keeping urchin populations in control. And so what you have here is the otter urchin kelp um, kind of uh, what the trophic cascade. If you don't have the otter and you don't have the sunflower stars, the urchin populations can explode and they can really eat. There's nothing controlling them in eating down the kelp. What I would like to do, this came out of a textbook somewhere, or the, the web, I would like to make sure that we have Nereocystis, uh, or bull kelp, down here, uh, because there was um, a really wonderful woman uh, that I write about in the chapter on bull kelp, who really makes the connection between otter and kelp, I mean, and bull kelp very specifically. And this is a woman that not that many people know about, uh, named Edna Fisher. And Edna Fisher uh, was a biologist at San Francisco State University. It wasn't the University, it was San Francisco State College in 1938. And 1938 is when Route 1 through Big Sur was completed. And that meant that people could drive down Big Sur, get out of their car, and look over the cliff. And in March of 1938, a, uh, a refugial raft of otter were discovered um, down in Big Sur, about 15 miles south of Carmel. Now, by 1917, it was assumed that sea otter were extinct along the entire California coast um, until that discovery in 1938. So that was March of 1938, and by April of 1938, within the month, Edna Fisher was down on the coast of Big Sur observing the otter. And she wrote some of the foremost and, and um, pioneering papers on the use of tools by otter. Um, and she also did something else that was really pioneering. She actually took her students down into the field to camp and to help her with observations. And it was these observations that led to a number of papers and also these 
uh, these drawings that I think are really illustrative of this relationship. You can see how um, camouflaged the otter are in the bull kelp in particular. And when she writes about the otter and they're nursing their pups, uh, their play habits, she's always writing about them in the Nereocystis, in the bull kelp. Uh, and all of her drawings uh, are showing them uh, in the bull kelp. Um, and in fact, bull kelp, uh, that, that uh, exploratory expedition where bull kelp was first described, it was written about that the, the Russian sailors had dubbed the Nereocystis, the bull kelp, sea otter cabbage, because that's what the otter were always found playing in. So making this connection in particular between these two species, I think is just a really um, important way of saying these, they evolved together. So um, these are more of her drawings. Uh, the otter not only placed their pups in the pools between the bull kelp fronds to keep them from floating away while they dive down to hunt, but they also wrap themselves up in the, in the blades of the bull kelp to keep from floating away, drifting away um, uh, when, uh, in the evening uh, when they're sleeping or resting. Now these, in, in Monterey, there are the great uh, macrocystis um, or giant kelp uh, forest, but there were, uh, as particularly in 1938, these swaths of bull kelp out surrounding the giant kelp forest. Now these, I think, uh, Reef Check, I was at a meeting where Reef Check was um, really, their, their surveys were saying that these bull kelp patches um, out on the perimeter uh, of the, the, the Monterey giant kelp forests were really um, reduced, vastly reduced. So, that, let's do, now we'll kind of just move on and I'll just go through some pictures of some basic stuff that's in the book. Um, the, the seaweeds are generally catalog, categorized into three groups, the reds, the browns, and the greens. Um, Olva is kind of the signature, sea lettuce is the signature of the greens. We hopefully tomorrow when we go out into the intertidal, we'll hopefully see some really luscious reds. And then the kelps uh, are in the brown category, or a subset of the brown category. Here's the kombu. Um, again, we have these American versions of the kombu. is actually the Japanese name, but we have American species that kind of fill, fill that same role. Um, and I just love this color brown. I mean, for me, it's just this fabulous color. <laughs> Um, this is Alaria. So this is um, uh, what, what uh, Larry was referring to, an elk. I was actually just in Point Arena two weekends ago, and there was tons of Alaria. Um, again, I'm playing with it in relation to this wonderful lithograph done by Alexander Postels. And you can really see the sporophyll blades that in this case are down in this species. They're down at the bottom of the organism. Uh, so that's why Larry can click the top. Um, unlike the bull kelp, if you clip those blades of the bull kelp, well, that's where all the spore production happens, and reproduction wouldn't be able to happen. And, and bull kelp and the postelsia are very similar in their life cycles. So um, here's that postelsia, um, or sea palm. This is, I think, the kind of state kelp of California. It's a protected kelp. You're really not allowed to tamper with this unless you have the commercial <coughs> license and you're educated on how to. Um, this is a yearbook uh, that comes up in my uh, story um, associated with a wonderful woman named Josephine Tilden. And I'm going to let you read about her, but she was just super amazing. And she actually established the very first marine station on the west coast, up on the west coast of Vancouver Island. It was the first marine station where scientists and students were brought specifically to study seaweed, and that was in 1900. And she brought all these students from the Midwest, and half of them were girls. <laughs> and she published that yearbook, and it's one of the only things we have left of that um, remarkable, remarkable effort there. Um, so here's the Postelsia sea palm in conjunction with the rupric. Surf grass and eelgrass, super important habitats, just like the kelp. The eelgrass um, is, eelgrass is in calmer waters, and the surf grass is in our rougher, rougher waters. But the eelgrass is enormously important as not only an oxygenator, but as a carbon sink, um, and as an eco-engineer. It is creating all this habitat for not only fish, but for the row of the fish, or the larval stage of so many invertebrates. They all depend on these, these refuges within, whether it's a kelp forest or the sea grasses. They're just super, super important. Um, as habitat, as 
carbon sink as oxygenators. Um, and this is me playing around with the textbook by this wonderful guy, E.L. Dawson, and you'll read about him. I'm just He's a wonderful humanist. But um, And here's just some pictures. Um, we are really right at the end of our time. This is a fabulous red called um, erythrophyllum, and hopefully we'll find some of this tomorrow. It's so beautiful. Um, oh, the sea sacs. So this is Halosachium, the sea sacs. Now these guys take this different approach to survival during those times when the tide is out. And all of these seaweeds come up with different strategies, and these guys actually hydrate from within to keep them from desiccating uh, during the, when the tide is out, when the, when the sun, sun is hitting. I'm just going to kind of flip through these because um, I want to get to some questions. This is a wonderful seaweed called Maziella volans, and this is really its color. I do not touch the color. They really look like this. That's why they're so fabulous. The feather boa cow, super iconic. Um, like we said, it's a, it's a uh, perennial. Um, this is the Fucus disticus, again, me working with postels. Uh, this is a rockweed in the higher end of tidal. The ulva, um, the signature of the greens. And the greens are where the chlorophyll of our land plants came from, the green algae. So my chapter on that um, talks about Lynn Margulis, another fabulous scientist who really um, bucked a trend. Um, color. So I write all about color. How is it that the seaweeds can collect different wavelengths of light down under the ocean waters, uh, where different wavelengths, not our red that we're so used to, well, they have accessory pigments. And the reds have a blue and a red accessory pigment that combine to create these shades of purple. Um, this is uh, one of my cyanotypes and where I've laid in one of my scans into the cyanotype printing. I'm going to be holding a cyanotype workshop on Sunday right here, and it's going to be really fun, and I will talk about the history of cyanotype printing and this legacy of nature printing. Um, so please, I think there might be some more. There's a couple spots left, so please do sign up. It's, it's, I think it runs from 11 to 2 to 30, um, and it's, it's, it's going to be really fun. So um, do join us with that. Here's a couple other cyanotypes. Um, this is a wonderful seaweed called uh, 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 cytosiphon. And we'll finish here. And this is my kind of mixing of old and new uh, around um, Stephanocystis osmundacea, or bladder chain rack. And this is a super common, it's not a kelp, it's actually a rack. Um, but this you will certainly find on the beaches. Um, it's, it's gone up and down, I think, in terms of its, the actual amounts uh, in its various places. Uh, but for me, this is all about layering and it's layering of information and also kind of all the interactions that take place in the intertidal and, and, and how important, you know, they're infinite really and we are only beginning to understand some of them. So we'll finish here and I think we have time for some questions. Yeah. We can turn on the lights yeah. and thank you guys. <laughs>
So wildlife biologists took a lot of the, the otter and kind of took them up to various places in Alaska and the Washington coast and um, kind of chucked them out there. And many of them died. Otter have this tendency to home, to go back to where they came from. Um, a few actually survived. And so the populations of otter in Alaska, in various places in Alaska, are booming. And they're protected there. So um, you know, there are a lot of foragers of, of, of invertebrates who are not happy about the huge you know, recovery of the otter population there. Um, but in California, that hasn't happened. And the population around um, the Monterey Peninsula has grown. And it's grown to about 3,000 otters. But it's kind of plateaued. And one of the things that's really different about <coughs> our coast to Alaska is that the Alaskan otter habitat is very three-dimensional. It's these coves and bays and you know, Queen Charlotte Sound. I mean, there's thousands of islands. Whereas our California coast is very linear. So these otter, to actually expand their territory, have to go across the Monterey Bay. They have to go out into shark territory. And so the young otter tend to get bitten by the sharks. They're not necessarily eaten, but they're bitten, so there's a lot of shark mortality. I'm not